Yes, as a, thank you, Roxana, for the introduction. I'm Filippo Mantovani from the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. I will talk a little bit about the Mont Blanc project and uh, uh, the experience that we had importing uh, applications to ARM-based uh, clusters. So, um, of course, I have uh, the usual introduction about the project for those in the room that uh, don't, don't know about Mont Blanc. The idea is to leverage the fast growing market of mobile technology for scientific computation in high performance computing in data centers. So this is our timeline. We started, we started long time ago in 2011 with the first phase of Mont Blanc, then we got Mont Blanc 2 and Mont Blanc 3. But all these phases are where they, they do have a structure in common. So basically, always we always uh, had a, a big part in uh, uh, deploying hardware, deploying prototypes, uh, and hand-in-hand uh, uh, -hand part in software, enabling the um, ecosystem that you need in order to run on a cluster based on ARM technology. And it, from this experience of deploying hardware and software, um, you always learn something. So we always have a, a look ahead work package in next generation uh, studies. And this was true in Mont Blanc 1, where uh, the, the, everything was based on mobile technology. I mean, John, this uh, morning was mentioning the Raspberry Pi experience of Red Hat in 2012, 2011. So very similar idea here. And Mont Blanc 2, we start uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, server technologies, because uh, ARMv8 in the meantime become available. And we did an effort in the system software and looking next generation, um, the pre-exascale compute node, we start thinking about it. And Mont Blanc 3, that is now the, the reality, is 100% uh, is focused on a, a server technology. There is no mobile, basically, anymore there. And the software is basically focusing on, on application now, or on mini apps, or, or, or really uh, industrial applications. And the next generation studies are more like, uh, let's try to have a product out of it. And this is uh, actually uh, the, the, the product that I'm going to mention, the, the, the Mont Blanc 3 demonstrator that I'm going to show you later. So this is the transition over time. So from mobile, uh, the crazy guys trying to do HPC on whatever, small devices, the transition till the idea of installing big system in data center is becoming a reality, right? Uh, fortunately, my introduction about the project can stop here today because tomorrow we will have Etienne, the, the current coordinator of, Mo, of the Mont Blanc 3 phase, presenting the rest of the details of the, pro, of the project in another uh, workshop. So I invite all of you, if you want more details about the project, to, to go to, to the talk of Etienne tomorrow at 9.50. Um, so about the Mont Blanc contributions, uh, as I said, Deploying ARM-based prototypes, put there some system software in order to be able to use them as a cluster, as a parallel machines, and then try real scientific codes. This has been always our uh, focus. And from this experience, learn from next generation studies, next generation cluster, next generation architectures. And of course, as several partners of the project are um, involved in um, academia and education, we have the educational challenge that I started uh, three years ago now of the student cluster competition. I will annoy you with one slide at the end about this. Um, so today I'm going to focus on the left part of this uh, uh, slide. Um, I have two slides about the, our platform. As I said, we started with the praise prototypes that were ARM devel um, Android development kits stacked one on top of the other, and then the mini cluster, very similar idea, and then the Mont Blanc prototype that was uh, the, the, the real um, uh, deployment of the first phase of the project, and then the 64-bit mini cluster, MV8, that are still up, and, uh, still up and running, and the Mont Blanc 3 demonstrator that uh, I'm going to show you uh, in a couple of slides. So today I'm going to talk about these two objects because are probably the, the only two that you cannot find in a uh, in a store, actually, or, well, at least the Mont Blanc one, maybe the Mont Blanc three, you can find it. <laughs> you can buy it soon. So um, the Mont Blanc uh, one prototype, uh, okay, this is the credit card form factor note card where you have one instance of Linux running. And basically, you have a dual, so uh, a dual core Exynos 5 uh, uh, SOC with a two core plus a Mali GPU that is uh, OpenCL programmable 
4 gigabyte of uh, low, low power DDR3 RAM and uh, some local storage and uh, some network, bridging USB 3 to Ethernet. So this, this is the setup and we put several of them, thousands of them all together installed in cluster and this is operational since more than two years now, still operational, so if you want to run. So this, this is what I mentioned before with the purely mobile experience. This is the, mobile, the, the SOC that was in one of the tablet, Nexus, whatever, I don't remember. Um, so the envelope is HPC but the, the, the SOC is really mobile. Um, so this is the other uh, reality that we are living now. <clears throat> we are living um, in uh, high-end techno server technology. So this is the uh, Dibona uh, Montblanc 3 demonstrator that is going to be a reality soon uh, in the in the Montblanc 3 phase uh, in the Montblanc 3 project. And you you see that uh, is uh, based on the Cavium Thunder X uh, two CPUs and installed within the Sequana. Um, the Sequana infrastructure that is the Bull Atos uh, in, uh, high-end infrastructure. So uh, as I said, Etienne is here, he is from Bull, so he has uh, details about this. Um, these are the two platforms that I wanted to present, uh, uh, but we have several others that we called, uh, as I said before, uh, mini clusters. So we have hardware. What do we need? We need system software uh, to operate it. So we, I have to admit I'm, I'm guilty uh, of this. Uh, we started hacking a lot, so we were not John compliant at the beginning, actually. <laughs> but there was no open SPC, there was no basically nothing. So, um, but still, now we have something that uh, uh, is in place. We have this Montblanc, what we call Montblanc system software, and uh, it is pretty much standard. And uh, it's tested on all our platform and uh, it's mostly based on open source packages and there is this willing uh, of this, this idea of contributing to the community and not just hacking. Even if the attitude uh, in my presentation will reappear. I, uh, this is a, okay, so, and one point is here that we did a small effort or well, a relatively big effort in, uh, in standardize the power measurement. Actually, my talk here last year was complaining about the non-standard way of measuring power in, in ARM. So I, I, I don't go that road because I already did it last year. But um, so we have hardware, we have just this high-end view of software. What can we do now? Just run applications. So when I say applications, I mean benchmarks, I mean mini apps, but I also mean production industrial codes. And uh, especially in Montblanc 3, we have one company that is involved as a partner in the consortium that it provide, is providing codes, use, real use cases, to the project. What do we do with this application? We usually trace this application uh, with uh, different objectives. So the first objective is to test the current solutions. When I say current solution, I mean hardware solution and software solution. So uh, I will have a couple of slides later of uh, the test that we did on the Cavium Thunder X and also about the software solution, the test that we did uh, evaluating the ARM HPC compiler. And uh, with these traces, we can also um, understand the code limitations. And then we have an effort within the project that is, uh, uh, say, helping the developer restructuring their code using uh, modern runtime solutions like the one proposed uh, in uh, OMPSS, uh, OpenMP4, basically. So that, that, that is going in the direction of, of, of taskifying the code and also testing new techniques like the dynamic load balancing. I have one slide mentioning this. What I'm not explaining in this presentation, but is still part of the project, is that with the same traces or very similar traces, we can say, Mm, we have a, a simulation infrastructure in which we can replay these traces just changing uh, architectural parameter and see, uh, say, how this impact next generation machine. This is called multi-scale uh, simulation architecture, MUSA. So uh, uh, Michel Moreto from BSC is here, so if you want more details ab about this last point, uh, you can, I can point uh, you to him. Okay, good. So. As I said, I want to show you a couple of examples of this, uh, what we do with these uh, applications. Um, the first step was enabling the puppy support in the Cavium Thunder X. We did, uh, at the, the time in which we started was uh, the, the performance monitoring unit was not supported by the kernel. 
that time was, it, it was one, and I, one year ago, I think, a little bit more. It was uh, kernel uh, 4.2.6, so we passed the kernel in order to support, to be able to access the performance monitoring unit. And then we extended, uh, well, this, this part of the kernel is now not needed anymore because this is already in the kernel. So if you buy Kavion Thunder X today, you install a Linux uh, with the kernel higher than 4.4 and you will get access to the PMU. What is still not in the, in the as far as I know, um, uh, in the main branches of uh, Puppy and LibPFM, the, the possibility of accessing the, um, the hardware counters in the CPU. So we extended that in collaboration with Kavium. And what we get is a patch that um, we started hacking here, but we did it in the, I hope, in the right way because we released this patch to, the, to both mailing lists of LibPFM and Puppy. And we are working, or we are in collaboration with uh, Puppy and LibPFM open to integrate our changes in order to have access to the hardware counter in the Calvin Thunder X. Why this is important? Well, because this enables the advanced analysis that I'm going to show you now. For, for um, as, as example, I took a code that is simple to understand and, and say uh, nice to show because has nice faces. That is the Lattice Boltzmann, a Lattice Boltzmann code structured uh, with MPI plus OpenMP um, um, parallelizations. It's basically mixing um, of, uh, so it's, it's studying mixing, the mixing layer of fluids at different densities. This is just for you to know. And this is structured with some uh, serial part at the beginning, initialization here. Well, not working, okay, the initialization part on the left. And then, and then you have faces, I mean here I, we have 10 iteration and then you have uh, green faces and blue faces uh, that we call propagate and collide. Propagate is uh, memory bound and collide is compute bound. The color code here is representing the IPC, the, the instruction per clock cycle. So basically you see that the memory bound part has a low IPC and the uh, collide part that is compute bound has a high IPC. Okay. Uh, so on the x-axis you, you have the time, on the y-axis you have the thread, and the color is, is basically giving you the, the quantity. Okay, so this is just to put you in context. So in order to get this trace, you need the hardware counters because the instruction per clock cycle, mm, you need to read uh, this from the CPU, right? So you see that even for a plot like this, in which you already have a good understanding of the structure of your application, okay, it's simple, but still. Um, you need access to the hardware counter. But with the hardware counters, we can not only do this kind of plots, but we can um, do advanced, a little bit more advanced uh, analysis. And here we have a, a plot in which we do, uh, we use track, we, we use um, clustering techniques in order to study how uh, the code, the section of the code are evolving at the, uh, running with different number of threads. And here you see with the same color code as before, in blue you see um, the part that is uh, uh, compute bound and in green you see the part that is memory bound. And the plot is IPC on the X axis and the total instruction on the Y axis. And here basically you clearly see what we already, what I, I spoiled here the, this plot because the compute bound part is scaling perfectly so you have uh, um, the blue part that is going from 6 to 48 cores and is basically not lowering the IPC, while the memory bound has the opposite uh, behavior, right? So every time that you add threads, you add people competing for, the, for one resource, it is the memory, so you have lower and lower IPC. So these are the kind of uh, uh, studies that we did and uh, uh, we do every day and that, that we can do if we have access to this uh, kind of performance. Uh, counters. Um, as I mentioned before, we had that we put our attention on the power measuring, mm, so the possibility of measuring power on our platforms, and actually, it's a, it's a little bit a nightmare on our platform because we have several different mini cluster with uh, server technology, embedded technology, with uh, onboard meters, off uh, off uh, board. Uh, uh, meters. So it, the sampling rate is different on every system, and uh, we have synchronization issues. But still, we try to integrate the power measuring uh, possibility that we have in Slurm. So whenever you do an S info on your uh, <clears throat> on your uh, 
a cluster on yes on your login node you see that you have a, a queue in which you can schedule jobs and in if you schedule a job in that queue your job will be running and uh, at the end you will find a csv file with the pa uh, power information in it and actually the same file is um, you can visualize it with paraver and here i do i show you the same trace as before or very similar in which we run the same code as before. You can see the green and the blue part. Uh, same metric as before, the IPC. And uh, uh, this is uh, in, the, in the high part. Sorry, my pointer is, is not working, so I will use the mouse. So um, here you have the IPC, but at the same time, you can see the power consumption. And you can see here you can see the limitation of this platform. Here we are on the ThunderX machine in which we use an external power meter that are very low uh, frequency sampling. So we have a time shift and we have coarse, grain, um, um, coarse power measurements. Of course, we cannot detect the, the iteration, right? But uh, we will see that, well, actually, in this, uh, in this plot, we are using another device in which we have high frequency uh, sampling rate for the power. Okay, and here, yes, we have uh, gigaflop in the, in, the part, in the higher part here. And then we have the power. And here, yes, we can measure more um, uh, several uh, measurements per second in the order of 100 per second. Uh, so we can detect the phase of this application. And then we can merge with these two and just get them the, the gigaflop per watt, the metric that is obsessing. <laughs> everybody, right? And uh, we can have it and explore it uh, at, the, at the granularity. I mean, we can zoom in right now. This is an image, but, but in the tool, in Paraver, you can zoom in and understand which part of your code is running at which uh, efficiency. And I think this is really important. And this is possible because we try to get the power out of our mini cluster and because we got the support uh, with the, R the hardware counters with Puppy, with a standard library like Puppy. Okay, good. So mm -hmm. this, this was a, a little bit the story of one of the test case. In reality, we can do also, um, well, the, I just mentioned this because we were debugging these mini clusters. And here I'm not plotting, plotting IPC. Here I'm plotting the, the frequency. If you see the range here is going to 1.2 gigahertz to 1.7 gigahertz. And you can see that there are spots in this application that happen to, to be the same as before, but um, in which the frequency is lower, is, is going down, basically. It's always running at maximum frequency, but at some point, something happened, it's still not understood. Um, so these tools, the message here is that these tools are not only good to, under, to, to debug or to understand, analyze your codes, but they are also good for deployment whenever you touch your hardware in order to understand what's going on. So if you have a problem with a governor, these kind of things. And also, uh, the, other, the other good point is that you are one click away to have uh, the energy to solution of your application. So not only the, the efficiency, but also you can get really easy uh, with one click, the energy to solution of your application, also in a, in a portion of your code. So think about different implementation of the same application, which is using more or less power, why, and so on. So you can try to investigate it with this kind of tool. And, and we have examples in the, in the project. Okay, so as I said, we do not only test hardware platform, we, we also test uh, software solutions. And here, well, this was uh, more slides, but it's, you see, I had to remove it because actually we did this study in July and uh, in, in the middle of August, we got a new uh, version of the ARM compiler. So I, did, I didn't want to show you all the data. We will rerun our analysis now after summer. So the idea was to do a comparison between GCC 7.1.0 and the ARM HPC compiler 1.3. So, um, the methodology was to take a polybench, uh, so a, a benchmark, and then mini apps, Lulesh and Comdi, and then a real application like Quantum Express, so that is using linear algebra and, uh, um, and also FFTs in order also to include the analysis of the um, R performance library. This was the idea. Actually, this is still the idea, and we are going to, to show all the tests, that, uh, the preliminary tests that we did 
uh, in a poster in supercomputing. But still, the message here is that what we notice is that uh, the R performance library is generating a lot more instruction. I mean, here you see the total instruction, the total execution, um, the total instruction. On top, you have uh, the ARM uh, HPC compiler, and bottom, you have the uh, ZCC. But on the other hand, on the left side, you have the histogram of the IPC, so of the instruction per clock cycle. So basically, you have a lot more instruction with the ARM, uh, the ARM HPC compiler, but it, somehow they are processed faster. So, so this is uh, balancing uh, not, not very good in the sense that the time you see that it differs, but still, this is very interesting from our point of view. This is one of the findings that we got and is still under development. But uh, uh, what I'm showing here is that uh, we evaluate this kind of software solutions and we try to use the same tools that I showed you before in order to get insight. And we are collaborating with ARM. Uh, I'm in contact with Chris Gutierrez about this, and he's commenting these results every day and providing feedback. So this is a, a real collaboration. Um, good. So I mentioned about uh, I mentioned the the test of the platform, uh, software and hardware, hardware. And now I want to show just one slide um, about the the uh, optimization or say the improvement that we can have. Uh, with the uh, programming model. So here, for this example, I consider another code that is Alia, is a code developed uh, within BSC, uh, is a finite element codes. If I show, I show you yet another trace with different colors, but anyhow. Here, in this part, this application has uh, uh, atomic operations. So it's coded like uh, OMP parallel force plus atomics. And here we have two, uh, two suggestions, say, we implemented two solutions. Uh, one is just a technique of uh, coloring. Uh, so remove the atomics and just use the parallel four. And the other one is using commuta commutative multi-dependencies. That is a fancy name for uh, saying, uh, let's try to update, uh, um, let's try to tell to the runtime that he can update one side or another but not the, the two at the same time. So in, instead of linearizing with atomics, you just say, you can do this, you can do this, you can choose the commutativity, I mean, you can choose the order, uh, but not, don't do it at the same time. So, and here, uh, th this is part of OMPS right now, uh, but we will push it uh, uh, in the OMP standards, or we suggest it to the OMP standards. And, um, here I have a little bit uh, the, the results, even combining this with dynamic load balancing. When I say dynamic load balancing, it's a simple concept. In, basically, um, whenever you have a process that uh, arrives first and is going idle, can lend his resources to another proce process within the same node. This is the, the, the idea. Okay, and here basically, um, the, key, the takeaway message is that with all these techniques on this code of finding finite element code, uh, we get, so summing the, the commutative multidependencies plus the uh, dynamic load balancing techniques, we can go even better than the MPI only implementation. And so basically here the MPI only is the green part, and if you, do, if you look at the dotted lines, this is uh, the OMPS plus DLB implementation. Okay, so um, this is uh, one example of uh, the kind of changes that we, we, we try to implement in the runtime that are more or less uh, transparent for the users uh, and that can benefit, um, and the user can benefit of them. Uh, another example, but this is, I pass it a little bit faster, I mean, it's just the same code. When you have coupled code, you have the fluid part and the particle part, and you have these two, uh, uh, to process uh, mm -hmm. in the same code, while this DLB technique can benefit, uh, can, can produce uh, benefits to the time, to do a role time to solution. And here, basically, you have uh, one of these uh, example with uh, DLB land when idle. That is exactly what, what I was mentioning. And you can see that basically the total, the overall execution time with the, the, this optimization is decreasing uh, in, uh, in, in, um, in a space in which we test different combination of uh, process and threads. Good, so um, this is, 
if you want, I show you, now I do a zoom out, so I show you a little bit of spots of very specific example, and now I zoom out and I show you all the Montblanc 3 application, that is a little bit of a nightmare. I just put it here just for you to understand that we are not just hacking here and there, but there is an overall uh, picture and there is an overall um, a strategy with all these codes. And actually, you can see here that the, the, the partners, uh, University of Graz, HLRS, BSC, and we have AVL, that is a company uh, in Austria that is providing use cases. Okay, um, yes. Yeah. Is there, is that, how, where is that fitting in? In the recruitment, recruitment section, and specification, and algorithms, but should we have a vectorization there as well? Or is that already incorporated into some of those? Okay, so, so far, I, as far as I understood the strategy within Montblanc 3, the vectorization part was more, pa most, sorry, was more part of the um, architectural study part. They, they do. I, I, I totally, yes. I understand. Okay, so noted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, and, uh, and uh, so take note about the, the, the vectorization here. And uh, yeah, no, I, I, I arrived at my conclusions and so, so also a little bit try to explain the, the title. So the hardware actually is not worrying, is not worrying too much. Uh, the, hardware, the hardware will evolve at some point eventually, so it's not a problem. Also because you have other market pushing the hardware. Uh, you have uh, the mobile market, the automotive market, so I'm not worried about the, the hardware part. Uh, tools can help understand the real problem and suggest evaluate alternatives, and here I, I think I convinced you that having access to the performance counter in the Cavium, as very small example, had benefits um, in, several, in several cases and in the performance analysis. And also correlating performance and power, so having access to the power information, even in the Apple way, uh, would be very, very useful. And um, the programming model and runtime will help overcome some of the limitations. Still, we have a lot to do, especially in vectorization. And uh, anyhow, the, the key message here is that uh, uh, the work performed here is not only, is not 100% uh, ARM-based. And actually, here is the explanation of the butterfly effect. I mean, what we are doing here is uh, mostly co um, helping the community. And actually, most of the thing that I was showing here is not ARM specific, so something is something that is really going beyond and, and helping evolving the hyper performance computing in general. So who knows which are the effects of what we are presenting here. As I said, I cannot finish without this slide, I'm sorry. Um, this is the, the educational challenge that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, since 2015, we participated in the student cluster competition, always with an ARM-based cluster. And well, the first year we struggled, and the following years we were able to submit all the results of all the challenges, and I'm pretty happy of it. I mean, we were not awarded of any performance figure, of course, but, uh, but still, I think this is a very uh, nice experience, first of all for the students, for me, and for also for ARM and the ARM in, in HPC as well. And uh, yeah, we had uh, the last two years, we got this uh, fan favorite award. And uh, this year, I'm still looking for a cluster. So if somebody in the room has platform, please contact me. Uh, I know that there are, the, there, are, there are a lot of nice hardware out there. So please, uh, that's, that's basically it. I want to leave you with the information of the consortium and uh, my contact in case you want to complain about the vectorization and more and more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>